And so uh, the course is uh, Isaiah, Isaiah for Beginners, and the subtitle, The Life and Times of Isaiah. And um, just to give you an idea of how we're going to uh, do this book, this is not going to be a line by line type study. It would, it would take two quarters, even three quarters to do all of that. I'm going to take some time in explaining how the book was written. That's the most important thing to understand if you're going to understand the book of Isaiah. And then I'm going to select some key passages in Isaiah that demonstrate uh, the, uh, his prophetic uh, utterances, uh, passages that perhaps we're familiar with, um, but we'll be able to see in context once you understand how this book uh, was written. Uh, I just want to take an informal survey here. How many people have actually read the book of Isaiah all the way through? Okay, that's a good number. Um, to say that the book of Isaiah is difficult to understand is an understatement. I mean, uh, you read the book and you kind of understand the individual words he's using, but you can never quite grasp the whole of what he's talking about. At times, you're not sure if Isaiah is repeating himself or he's talking about someone else or he's talking about himself. You're never quite sure where you are as you read through his uh, book or perhaps he's you know, introduced something new. You're never quite, you're always off balance. At times, you feel that you're on you know, solid ground as he recounts some historical events with real people in real time, but then without warning, he goes off and, and, and relates a vision given to him by God. Now many times the literary devices you know, that are used to help the reader discern the meaning actually confuse the reader if he's not familiar with Hebrew, uh, Hebrew poetry and Isaiah's style of writing. So this series is going to try to simplify and clarify Isaiah's prophetic message for those who are reading him, obviously, in modern times. So we begin with a brief introduction of Isaiah himself and follow with how this book was written, which is, you know, in my own studies, which I found fascinating, just how the book was put together is really fascinating. So uh, Isaiah refers to uh, events and times uh, before his ministry. And he also talks about things that are in the future beyond his own lifetime. Uh, so he talks about the past, he talks about the present, he talks about the near future, he talks about the future way far uh, in advance. So let's review a brief timeline of Jewish history and the various books and authors who recorded Jewish history. And I think if we do this first, it'll help us to identify some of the major events that Isaiah is going to be talking about, as well as pinpoint where exactly does Isaiah fit in the history of the Jewish people. So let's take a look at this Old Testament survey. If you picked up some sheets in the back, and if you didn't and want to, don't be shy, get up and go back there. There's a a lectern, and there are two. There's your, your lesson notes, just to follow along, and then there's this extra, uh, you know, this extra sheet that I've added, which is the Old Testament survey. It's a great resource. You can keep it, fold it in your Bible. You know, you, you'll be able to go back and refer to it in the future whenever someone is talking about the old period. So you'll notice at the top of the survey, there's the period, meaning the period of time, and then the time in years, and then the major events and characters, and then there are, uh, there's the heading books. In other words, the books of the Bible that talk about those particular things. So briefly, uh, we begin with the, what's called the antediluvian period, antediluvian. Diluvian uh, referring to the flood. Anti meaning before the flood. So the period before the flood, that period of time 5,000 plus BC. Major events and characters, well, the creation and the fall of man, the promise of redemption, the increasing of sin in the world, Noah and the flood, all of those events 
are written about in Genesis chapter one to eight. So you could say the antediluvian period is written about in Genesis chapters one to eight. Next period is post diluvian period after the flood, 3000 BC roughly. And here you find the genealogies of man, the spreading of idolatry, the Tower of Babel, and Genesis chapters nine to 11 talk about these and other uh, events of that period. The third period mentioned is the patriarchy around 2000 BC. And uh, here you, uh, in the Bible, you uh, read about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes and how they were formed. And Genesis chapters 12 all the way to chapter 50 talk about these events. And also the book of Job uh, uh, not only was written, but is um, uh, situated in that uh, time period. Then you have the period of bondage uh, fourth period, 1600 BC, 400 years uh, in captivity, the, the people of God, the, the uh, Israelites, 400 years in Egypt, uh, Moses, the Passover, the Exodus from Egypt, and you have uh, the Exodus chapter uh, one to 12, talk about that. Fifth period is the period of conquest, 1400 BC, uh, this will talk about the 40 years in the desert, the arrival of the uh, God's people into the promised land, the judges who govern, if you wish, uh, at that time and the 12 tribes, and also Samuel is introduced uh, during this period. And we have several books now that talk about these events, Exodus 13 to 40, the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel chapters one to 10, all of these books talk about these particular things. So, so sometimes, you know, if you're wanting to study a particular events in the Bible, this uh, survey here will help you at least pinpoint which books talk about which events. Then we have the United Kingdom uh, around 1000 BC. And here the tribes uh, are then ruled by one king. And so you have the, story, the stories of Saul and then David and then Solomon. And again, many books talk about this period of the United Kingdom. First Samuel 11 to 31, second Samuel, uh, first Kings one to 11, first Chronicles, second Chronicles uh, one to nine, the book of Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, all those books are talking about the period of the United Kingdom. Then we have the period of the divided kingdom. There was civil war uh, after the death of Solomon. And so the united country uh, broke into two. Uh, the northern kingdom, 10 tribes. The southern kingdom, uh, two tribes, uh, 800 BC. And here uh, you have uh, the establishment of the north and southern kingdoms. You have the apostasy, the great apostasy, people going away from God and going into uh, pagan uh, Baal worship. Uh, you have the destruction of the Northern Kingdom and the emergence of the prophets. And this is where Isaiah is. This is where we can pinpoint Isaiah's ministry. He's during the time of the divided kingdom. There are other books that talk about this time. First Kings chapter 12 to 22, Second Kings, Second Chronicles 10 to 36, as I mentioned, the prophet Isaiah, but also the prophet Hosea, Micah, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, uh, Jeremiah, and Zephaniah. All of these prophets are talking about this particular period in Jewish uh, history. So we'll be studying Isaiah. Now you know when Isaiah preached and what was going on during his uh, during his time. Then the seventh period is the period of exile, 600 BC. Uh, here we read about the destruction of Jerusalem, 70 years in uh, captivity in Babylon, and those who write about this period, Jeremiah and Daniel, Ezekiel, and of course, Lamentations. Next period is the period of restoration around 500 BC. And here we talk about the return of the remnant from Babylonian captivity and also the end of idolatry. The Jewish people 
never again go back into idolatry after this period. And you have the writers Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and Malachi, uh, who write about this period uh, in Jewish history. And then there's what's called the period of silence, uh, 400 BC all the way to Jesus, well, to John the Baptist anyways. No prophets, no inspired writings during that time. Uh, this is called, among other things, the intertestamentary period. Uh, during this time, there were books that were produced. They weren't inspired books, but they were books that wrote about and described uh, what was going on during this uh, period of time. Uh, we call them the apocryphal books, uh, meaning the hidden books or the hidden writings. And for example, you have the book of Esdras or the book of Judith or the book of Maccabees. These uh, particular books uh, talk about uh, that period of time, 400 BC to the time of Jesus. All right, so that gives you a little, um, just a, a quick uh, survey of this uh, period uh, and the time when Isaiah was um, uh, functioning as a uh, prophet of the Lord during the period of the divided kingdom. So let's talk a little bit about Isaiah, about Isaiah himself. Isaiah, it says he was the son of Amoz. Uh, and Amoz is mentioned several times in connection to Isaiah, but we don't have any other information about him, only that he was the father of Isaiah. Isaiah is considered one of the major prophets, along with Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. A major prophet uh, because of the length of his book. Uh, not that he was more important than another prophet, simply because uh, their books, not only him, but Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, they had uh, books that were uh, longer than the other uh, prophets. Also, uh, his book appears first among these other prophets, a position of honor, since Isaiah is sometimes referred to as the prince of prophets. And if you read his book and compare it to some of the other books, you'll, you'll know why they gave him this title. Now Isaiah's name means the Lord saves, the Lord saves. And as we noted in our you know, Old Testament timeline, Isaiah lived and prophesied during the time of other Jewish prophets. Amos and Hosea and Micah also uh, prophesied during the time of uh, during the time of Isaiah. We also know that his ministry began in 740 BC because he himself mentions in Isaiah chapter six, verse one, that his visions began the year that King Uzziah died. And the death of King Uzziah is recorded in history. And so that's how we know when Isaiah's prophecy uh, and prophetic work began 740 BC. Uh, we also know that he was married and in his own writings, he refers to his wife, not by her given family name, but rather by the term, the prophetess. He called her the prophetess in uh, uh, chapter eight, verse three. And he may have done this because she was the wife of a prophet or because she herself was used by God in this way. But we have no record, no official record of any prophecies uh, that she uh, made. Now Isaiah has uh, two sons uh, that were given names that signified prophetic statements made by their father. In other words, Isaiah made a prophetic statement and in order to kind of really you know, double down on it, he named his children, he named his sons according to the prophetic statements uh, that he had made. Uh, let's uh, get their names, there you go. One of them was uh, Shir Jashub, Shir Jashub, which means the remnant return, the remnant return. And this was a prophetic reference of the literal and spiritual return of Judah after their destruction and their exile to Babylon for 70 years. He names his son according to what will happen uh, to the Jews. And then he has another son, uh, and his name is Mar Shalal Hashbaz. Mar Shalal Hashbaz, which means four different words. Haste, spoil, speed, 
and pray. Now this name implied the eventual attack of the Assyrians on the northern kingdom of Israel and its neighbor Syria. And so Assyria, those who were doing the attacking, was anxious to attack, ready to destroy and pillage all of its enemies. And so the boy's name referred to the character of the enemies that would come in and attack uh, uh, the uh, Israelites, haste. They came as a swift army, spoil. They came to take the spoil, speed. Uh, they were lightning quick in their attack. It didn't take them long to overcome uh, the enemy and pray. Israel would be the prey. And so the name refers to events that were going to take place uh, in, um, in Israel. Uh, it's also interesting to note that the Bible mentions the details of the marriages of several of the prophets. And I thought it might be interesting when we speak about these men to know something about their uh, personal lives. Jeremiah, for example, was celibate. We find that out in Jeremiah 16, two. He never married. Uh, Hosea, his wife was unfaithful. Uh, and we find that out from the beginning. He's told to take a wife who's going to be unfaithful to him. Uh, Ezekiel's wife died suddenly, but he was not allowed to mourn over her. Very unusual. We read about that in uh, Ezekiel 24, 16 to 18. And uh, we find out that Isaiah's wife collaborated with him in naming their sons with names that reflected prophecy concerning Israel and Judah. Now, Isaiah uh, probably spent most of his life in Jerusalem. And uh, judging by the quality of his writing and uh, his access to the royal court of successive kings, he had access, and you know, in those days, you just didn't walk into the palace to see the king. If you write about what's going on into the royal court, it means that you have some sort of position and so Isaiah talks about what's going on at the royal court, meaning he had some sort of high position. Uh, he was uh, you know, involved with uh, Uzziah, of course, uh, Jotham, uh, Ahaz, the king Ahaz, and then the king Hezekiah. And scholars believe that he was a well-educated, wealthy aristocrat, or perhaps uh, he was part of a priestly family, and this is what gave him access to the royal court. Even though it seems that Isaiah had a high position in the society of his time, he was very much aware of the plight of the poor, uh, the excesses of the rich, and the injustices that were visited on the common man by those who were in power, as well as the immorality and the unfaithfulness that existed at every level of society, both uh, uh, rich and poor. And so despite the advantages of education, excuse me, despite the um, uh, advantages of education and wealth, we're talking about Isaiah now, and the access that he had to the royal court as God's prophet, uh, he was very much like the more common prophets of the day, uh, who were social justice prophets, uh, who were his contemporary, Amos and Hosea and Micah. You know, they spoke out against injustice. Their prophecies were not just about what's going to happen in the future, you know, uh, 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 or some prophecy uh, 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 that would take place you know, in the near future. Many times these prophets spoke up against the injustices that were taking place in their society, the uh, immorality that was taking place in that society, and of course also the false worship that was uh, taking place in that society, not just in the future, but uh, you know, right then and there. And despite uh, all of his uh, wealth and position, Isaiah was very much like these uh, social justice uh, uh, prophets. Not only did he speak truth to power, he did so with a very beautiful and complex and majestic style of writing, which we will investigate as the lessons go on. And so this bold and fearless pronouncement of God's word is what probably led to his death at the hands of Manasseh, who Jewish tradition says had Isaiah executed 
by having him sawn in two. And we read about this in Hebrews 11, uh, 37, where uh, the Hebrew writer is talking about the heroes of faith, you know? And he talks about all the things that the heroes of faith suffered. And he says in verse 37, he says, they were stoned, they were sawn in two. That, that bit right there, they were sawn in two, is a reference back to Isaiah and the way that he was martyred at the hands of, um, at the hands of Manasseh. Um, as far as the times, you know, what are the times? Uh, what, what was it like when Isaiah, you know, politically and uh, religiously, what was going on in those times? Little map here to help us understand some of the geopolitical pressures that were taking place. Isaiah wrote uh, during the stormy period marking the expansion of the Assyrian Empire and the decline of Israel. We know that the Israel reached its peak of wealth and influence and power during the, role, during the reign of Solomon, who built uh, you know, on the foundation of David. And so the temple was built during his time. Uh, the, 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 the country was united, fabulously wealthy and respected and at peace with, with its neighbors. That was a high point, but after Solomon died, and the civil war started and, and there was a breakup between north and south, then there began a decline. Well, while the decline was taking place in Israel, you know, north and south, the north was referred to as Israel, the south of the country was referred as Judah. Well, to the very far north, there was uh, the country of Assyria, and that country was expanding its power. It had a great army, it was becoming the world power uh, during its time. And so under the king uh, Tiglath uh, Pilser III, he reigned 745 to 727 BC. The Assyrians swept westward into Aram. We see Aram here. This is uh, also called Syria. Uh, he swept towards uh, Aram and then into Canaan, where the northern kingdom of Israel uh, was located, so they swept downwards into Israel. In response, the kings of Aram and the king of Israel tried to pressure Ahaz of Judah of the southern kingdom into joining an alliance against Israel, uh, against, uh, not Israel, against Assyria. So you see the picture? You've got Aram and Israel, you know, a joint defense pact and they're trying to talk Judah to join them. So the three of them would be uh, you know, united together against the attack of, of Assyria. Well, instead of joining this alliance, Ahaz, the king of Judah at the time, chose to ask Tiglath Pilser, that's this guy up in Assyria, to ask the king of uh, Assyria for help against Israel and Aram. Now today, uh, the political term for that is double cross. <laughs> he double crossed uh, the king of Aram and the king of Israel who were trying to get him to join their alliance by jumping over them and making an alliance with Assyria to protect Judah against Aram and Israel. So instead of joining the alliance, he made a deal with Assyria. And so uh, what's important about this uh, arrangement is that Isaiah condemned this decision. Isaiah, who lived during this time, who was preaching during this time, condemned this treachery and, and warned the king against making an alliance with Assyria. Well, Assyria did help Judah uh, by conquering and deporting the northern kingdom. But this left the southern kingdom even more vulnerable and exposed to attack from the north. Now Israel could not be a buffer uh, a country or state to protect them from attack. It had been you know, destroyed and all the people had been scattered. And so now Judah, uh, their northern flank is, uh, is unprotected. And so uh, the godly king Hezekiah prayed earnestly and Isaiah prophesied uh, 
that God would force the Assyrians to withdraw, and we find out in Isaiah chapter 37 that they do withdraw from their attack on uh, Judah. Nevertheless, Isaiah warned that because of her sins, Judah would be defeated and brought into captivity, not by the Assyrians, but by the Babylonians. This was the nation that eventually defeated the Assyrians and took over as a, the, a world power at the time. And so the Assyrians did not overtake Judah, uh, but the Babylonians uh, did. Now, although the fall of Jerusalem would not take place until 586 BC, Isaiah's uh, prophecy, a hundred years before then, uh, said the following, uh, that uh, uh, Judah would be destroyed, uh, that uh, there would be a captivity of the people and they would be brought to a foreign land, and then eventually they would be restored back from their captivity to their uh, home nation. And he made this prophecy a hundred years before these events actually took place. Isaiah also predicts the rise of Cyrus, who would, write, uh, who would unite the Medes and the Persians to create the Medo-Persian empire, if you wish. And under Cyrus, uh, 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 would conquer the Babylonians. And so uh, Isaiah even spoke about this uh, particular event way before it uh, takes uh, place. Uh, we find out in history the decree of Cyrus would be the thing that eventually would allow the Jews to return home in order to rebuild their city and their wall and their temple. That took pl place in 537 BC. And so in his prophecy, Isaiah claimed that this deliverance would prefigure another deliverance from sin, which would take place even further in the future. So you see what I'm talking about when I talk about, you know, uh, he speaks truth to power, hang on. He speaks truth to power in the present time. He tells the king right now, don't do what you're about to do it won't work, and sure enough, it doesn't. He then uh, 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 makes a prophecy for the future, uh, that in the future, 100 years, that's the near future. In the future, you know, a nation would come in and destroy uh, Judah, would uh, carry them off into captivity, but eventually they would return. That's a prophecy in the near future. And then he also makes prophecies in the far future, when he talks about, but one day, someone will come and deliver uh, uh, God's people from their sin. Uh, and of course there, uh, he's talking about the Messiah. And our problem when we read uh, the book of Isaiah is that sometimes we're not sure, is he talking about right now? Is he talking about the near future? Or is he talking about the far future? And so I think uh, the uh, preparation lessons that I've got uh, for you uh, for the next couple of weeks will help all of us understand uh, his, form of, uh, his form of writing. So Isaiah's uh, many visions and prophecies, uh, again, spoke of the present, the near future, and the distant uh, future. Um, all right, we've got a, uh, I want to finish my class this morning with a video. Yeah, just enough time for that. Uh, and, and for all of you who are you know, uh, concerned about copyrights and stuff, we have permission to show this video uh, to a live audience, which we will do. Uh, and those of you who are uh, maybe watching this class in the future, I'm going to make a little prophecy here. If you're watching this class in the future, you know, online on YouTube or on BibleTalk.tv, there is a link that you will see uh, on, your, you know, on your screen and simply click that link and it'll bring you uh, to view the uh, video that we are going to view here live uh, this morning. 